Welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I'm your host, Kevin Benedict. I'm a futurist and partner here at TCS. And I want to thank each of you for joining us today. Our guest, I'm so excited to announce, is Paul Tyler. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Now, Paul, he's the chief marketing officer at NASA Financial Group. And he's also a fellow podcaster. He leads the branding strategy and marketing efforts and drives their digital and insert tech initiatives. He recently launched their direct-to-consumer channel for term life, final expense, and fixed annuities. Now, for those of you not into insurance, you might go, why do I want to listen to this? There's a lot of reasons because we're talking about the future and who knows more about the future than insurance companies and their actuary tables and teams looking into those things. That's why I stick with us here. So NASA offers insurance products that help meet retirement goals, such as protecting savings, delivering guaranteed income or paying for health care costs. And why is this important? We might ask. Let me read you this. By 2050, the global population age 65 or more will be nearly double what it is today. The number of people over the age of 80 will triple, approaching half a billion globally. Supporting an aging population is a worldwide concern, but this demographic shift is especially pronounced in Japan, where more than a third of Japanese will be 65 or older by mid-century. Wow. Those numbers represent massive demographic shifts in the future. So I'm going to ask our expert Paul today the first question. How are those kinds of numbers going to change societies, Paul? It's shocking. I think people aren't prepared for it here in the U.S. And just to even put a, a finer point on on what's happening. 10,000 people a day are turning 65. What that means, you know, for jobs, for consumer demands, um, for just basic healthcare questions, I think it's going to have uh, enormous implications for us as society. You know, I think, and it's interesting, a lot of this is driven, you know, given by the baby boomer population. Huge wave came through, defined our music tastes, our clothes, our cars. I'm like on the tail end of this thing. And now, you know, where do those people live? You know, what do they do in retirement? Who drives their cars? Do they drive their cars? Will somebody else do that well for them? Or is, you know, will some of these, you know, self-driving cars take the place of this stuff? There are just a tremendous amount of, I think, changes that we will see in a very short space of time. And I think you uh, alluded to it. I think Japan's a really good glimpse into what our future may look like. That's going to be a fascinating discussion. So there's a whole lot of things go along with that aging. So at TCS on the Future of Business team, we're looking at all kinds, I mean, literally hundreds of what we call future impactors and how these impactors will all come together and converge to change the world and to provide us the future we're going to live. And uh, some of those things that we're tracking are the future of retirement. We're looking at elder care and post-retirement. We're looking at increased lifespan, shifting views of retirement. What does retirement really mean if you're going to live another 40, 50, 60 years after retirement? It starts to change how we might look at retirement. Healthy life extensions. What does that look like? How long is that? Uh, Connected health. How's that going to impact our aging process? Reskilling society so that they're still productive and can still be employed. Smart homes, regenerative medicine social robots to help with loneliness and isolation retirement. I imagine your team is looking at similar kinds of trends out there in saying, what's retirement going to look like? Any additional ones you would add to that list, Paul? You've hit a lot. I think perhaps one that will be a very interesting, I think, is a support network. Um, you know, one, one of the biggest you know issues that you face that uh, elderly face is loneliness. How is that going to shape or redefine you know how we stay connected or stay disconnected? I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, how might those trends we just talked about financially impact those in retirement? Let's say there's going to be healthy life extensions, and the quality of life is going to be longer. Our life is going to be longer. Our lifespan is going to be longer. 
uh, that's got to have an impact financially. Absolutely. And, you know, I talked to one person um, a few months ago and he said, you know, Paul, when I start counseling people on retirement planning, I tell them they should get ready for a marathon. Why? Because, you know, when you turn, you know, 65, you probably have another, you know, 26 years that you're going to need to, on average, pay for and figure out what what you want actually want to do during this this period of time. 26 years is a long time. Oh, by the way, you may live a lot longer than than, uh, 26 years. And, you know, what happens um, if you don't have enough money those latter years? And they're they're very big expenses. I think, you know, there there are a number of studies, uh, some of which have been very publicly proclaimed and disputed. But, you know, I know that I think Medicare spends something like 28% of its its, uh, medical expenses on people in the last six months of their lives. So you think about it, argue the the percentages, you know, I've seen the figures range from 20 to 40%, but you know, 20% or 40% of all your medical care costs may occur in those last six months. Where is that coming from? What does that mean? If you plan to leave a legacy to your kids, if you haven't planned for it, it can totally disrupt your plans. Um, so I think there's a lot of healthcare funding issues people don't think about when they retire. They think, well, I'm going to, when I turn 65, I'll take Social Security and I'll get Medicare. Well, Medicare actually costs $6,000 per spouse okay, on average each year. Now, that's just Medicare. Medicare, which it doesn't cover your deductible. You got to plan for these expenses, and it's it's not cheap. You know, you may be spending upwards of ten to $12,000 a year per year in retirement. How are you going to do that? Mm-hmm. Um, more importantly, where are you going to do this? Um, geography plays a big role in this. Some of these areas that may be a low-tax areas may look wonderful when you take pictures, may not have any kind of hospital network anywhere near where you live. What are you going to do then? Finances are important, but where do you want to live? How do you want to live? Who are you going to live next to? How important is medical care? How are you going to pay for that medical care? Major issues. Major issues you need to think through. And it's not something you want to leave until the you know very last minute. One of the terms that people are discussing a lot right now is aging in place. Yes. You know, so many people, my mom included, and people around me that I know, they want to stay in their own homes as long as possible, all the way to the end if they can. They would rather bring services into their own premise or home uh, rather than going to a different kind of institution or organization. So what needs to really happen to make that kind of thing possible? First of all, there need to be uh, protections in place for seniors. I think in Japan, and there are actually laws that say you can't forcibly take a person, you know, from their apartment and put them into a, in a you know, some sort of assisted living care. I mean, I think, you know, my understanding is that society has recognized that there's a lot of social well-being linked to where you live, a place that you've been familiar with for many, many years, makes it easier for you to live longer. You know, you can't under overestimate the value of happiness in living a, a nice long retirement. Part of that is living in a place you want to, living in a place where with which you're familiar. So one is I think there, there's a huge psychological benefit of letting people stay in community, in the community in which they uh, have lived for a very long time. There's also, as you know, a, a huge financial benefit to doing that. The cost of assisted living is skyrocketing. You know, on the East Coast, you know, it's not uncommon to be paying $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 a month for a semi-assisted to assisted living. Now, fast forward to memory care. Oh my gosh, my mother suffered from dementia. It would have been $14,000 a month to put her in memory care out on the East Coast. Staggering, right? Yeah, Staggering. here in Boise, it's eight to 10. My dad spent time there before he passed away. Yep. It was like 8,500 a month, even when he was in there. No, and, and, uh, how many how many parents can afford this? And then what kind of what kind of debt and stress does that put on the the children of those adults or those families? And and what resources does, does that take away from areas like kids' education and kids' well being? Um, so I, I think there's a psychological benefit to keeping in place. There's also a financial benefit in place. The question is, how do you do that? If you went through this, I went through this with my mother living remotely in Salt Lake City. Let me tell you, it was hard. You know, now, thank goodness at that point, you know, 
we actually had online banking. I was able to do a lot of her care, you know, via websites, via apps, um, via phone, where I couldn't have done that five years ago. I think technology is opening the door to making this much, much more um, possible. So, um, yeah. And Paul, my mom knows how to order groceries and they actually arrive on her front door. It took a few <laughs> practice runs, we'll say, to make sure that what she actually thought she ordered actually arrived at the door. But now <laughs> she, she, now it's habit. She knows yes. how to bring groceries right to the door. COVID, just like it kind of changed and accelerated digital transformation within the education space, I think it also kind of pushed a lot of people into digital transformation in their own lives just to try to protect themselves and continue you know, enjoying the quality of life they can as best they could during COVID without exposing themselves. So scientists right now, Paul, they're, they're just a lot of discussion happening out there about radical life extensions. I just hear that. I read articles constantly. One of them recently said that within 10 years, they believe every year that you live will be an added year on top of that through technology. So yeah, every year um, that you are alive, your end of life will be extended by another year. It's just fascinating. So if these hopes are fulfilled, what would need to happen to make those radical life extensions actually quality time rather than just an increased quantity of time? So suddenly we're living to 115 on average. What would the world, what would have to change? And by the way, there are a couple of actuaries who are sick to death, right? When I, we bring this up to them because, you know, life insurance, right? We, you know, people pass away prematurely. You know, the longer people live with annuities, actually the, the less money we make as a company. It's an interesting business to be in. Now, of course, we want people to live happy, long lives. And we're in the business of protecting families and, and helping people live as as independent as uh, independently as possible. So, and we have some smart people working on the products to do this. And I think, first of all, one of the products that I think is absolutely key for people to understand is pe some people call longevity insurance. Um, some people call protected income. We in the insurance business call annuities. People say, well, what's an annuity? Very few people can tell you, but you say, well, do you have social security? You're going to get a social security check. The answer is, of course I am. Well, you have an annuity. This is an annuity. You will get paid a certain amount of money as long as you live. A lot of people say, well, it's an investment. What's what's the ROI on it? Annuities are investments. They're insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Kevin, what was the ROI on your homeowner's insurance last year? I hope it was horrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> However, I hope it was wasted money. <laughs> However, for the one person in your neighborhood whose house actually burned down, probably the best purchase they ever made. That's the same thing with annuities is basically, yes, we're taking money, we're investing them in, in bonds, but we're pooling everybody's mortality risk. And so we're selling these annuities to lots and lots and lots of people. And we're playing the average, right? Some people are going to die early. Guess what? The annuities were not a great deal, but you know, if you were one of those people who passed away early, as, as one of my uh, mentors in the business said, you know, Kevin, how long, when exactly do you plan to die and how long are you going to stay dead? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. However, if you're one of those people who, yes, took their supplements, did their exercise, ate right, um, did all the following things, and they've extended their life out to 115. They you know got what? lucky. They're going to make out like bandits with this type of thing. So I think first and foremost, people understand you need to, the way to protect ourselves, first and foremost, is work together, you know. Um, and there are a lot of good products, a lot of good companies out there. You know, I'm not saying look at ours, but look at somebody's. If you're you're approaching retirement, take a look at these things because it's one of the, the, the best things you can do for getting a guaranteed stream of income. And all the studies say that people who have – regular payments in retirement that they can count on, like a salary effectively, a salary from Social Security, a salary from their pension, if they were so, if you were so lucky, um, a check from an insurance company, you're actually more happy, you're actually happier. And if you're happier, you're going to be healthier. And if you're healthier, you're going to live a longer time. You don't want stress in retirement. Um, and I think 
uh, solving for a predictable income each month is probably the first thing people should do. So you've got, you've got some sort of a psychological assurance yes. that your bills are paid, your house is paid for, your health insurance is covered, and we can go visit your kids. Right. Just, you know, those minimal things you know you want to do, take care of them. Um, great if you've got a yacht. <laughs> great if you want if you've got enough to do some other things, but just take care of the basics. Um, and, and the rest, the stress will that will that will take care of a lot of things. And it'll it'll relieve stress, which is a huge killer in and allow you not to sit in the house and be lonely. And loneliness is awful, awful problems that we need to tackle um, as a society uh, for for seniors. Absolutely. So let's talk about the technologies available to help people post-retirement be able to age in place. And, you know, when we think about the healthy life extensions, so the need maybe to live longer, what technologies are you seeing out there that contribute to that ability? Yeah, and I, I am seeing tremendous innovation, and I, I, I see tremendous in, innovation around sort of the Medicare uh, mid advantage mid sub space uh, because people buy are buying healthcare. I think a lot of companies and carriers are looking at exactly that. They're thinking, listen, we got to control health costs. How do we do this? Let's sort of test a variety of products and services that'll make this stuff more affordable. Um, now in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, you know, we have an incubator we launched about three years ago in partnership with a number of other ones. And uh, one of the incubators um, uh, in Hartford focused exactly on managed healthcare. And Kevin, we brought this through some just tremendous companies, some that, some that are actually um, you know, winning some some awards right now. And you wouldn't believe where this technology is coming from. Um, just as an example, um, specialized radar used in the DMZ in Korea. You know, what, what would this have to do with uh, managed care? Well, uh, one of the companies has actually took that radar technology and brought it into managed care facilities and homes. And not only can it detect motion, but it can actually detect heartbeats. It, actually can, it can actually count the number of people in a room. It's massively interesting technology. Single application it's had has been fall prevention, fall detection. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, when do most falls occur in nursing homes and or assisted living centers? It's actually when the people go use the bathroom, stand up, blood rushes to head, they get dizzy, they fall. And it's actually, they put this in, can you imagine, Technology was used to detect foreign troops in South Africa is being used now in, nurse, in assisted living centers. Kind of cool stuff. So I, I've seen a lot of interesting technology in fall detection using accelerometers, leveraging you know technology wearables that are you know commercially available. To huge, um, I, I would say, uh, set of innovation in terms of motion detection in a house. So AI sort of noticing how is this person walking around? Are they in bed at a certain time? Are they moving at a certain time? Being able to start to detect some anomaly and alert people. Um, lots of trials on this. Now, uh, again, no surprise, I'm sure you, well, what's the biggest obstacle? Seniors themselves. They don't like to be monitored. This is, right. this is interesting. This has been the biggest... If all of these technology companies, the biggest obstacle they've had to overcome is denial. Seniors say, I don't need it. I don't need the help. No, I'm fine. Thank you very much, Paul. Go away. I'm fine by myself. This is my mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It was, I, I don't want this thing monitoring my, my I, I, you know, no, you're spying on me. Sure. Get out. You know, I don't trust this thing. Technology has, has just advanced so far. And I think we've got to figure out like, What's the language? How do we get people to actually adopt this stuff and actually use it in a, in a setting? Um, that yeah. reminds me of a couple of things, Paul. One is um, I've been testing this social robot. So I tried to get my mom to participate in this trial, saying, Mom, you know, we will create this um, middle aged lady that is the avatar for an AI, a social um, artificial intelligence system behind it, which can talk to you all day long or anytime you want. You could tell stories and everything else. She's, you know, I could just see in her eyes. She thought it was a demon. 
<laughs> Keep that demon away from me. You know, I, I it was just, oh, that was going to be a problem. This technology will arrive and we'll figure out how to pull this stuff together. And I've seen a couple of companies with uh, real interest in technology um, uh, and television screens. So this was pre-Zoom, right? <laughs> pre, pre when we all knew Zoom. Um, put a tell, you know, I, I saw a lot of kind of interesting intentionally simplified sets where you could drop a camera on top of a television screen, mm -hmm. very easy to control and, and do the, uh, you know, run a webcam. It's funny thinking, you know, how just a couple of years propel this. Um, what was the biggest struggle is the staff at these assisted living centers really weren't IT help desk and they really needed to be IT help desk to do this. Oh, now, Fast forward to the pandemic, okay, we pushed really hard to help our advisors get in front of clients when they couldn't get in clients. Zoom made it, you know, opened up a whole new world. Yeah. Um, we actually worked with one of our advisors to do a um, remote webinar. You know, a lot of these agents, you know, prior to the pandemic would get people into a room, get them to a, you know, restaurant. Okay, that was all shut down. Okay, they'll try anything. They'll Now they'll finally try, try Zoom. And I was on one of these and he invited, I don't know, maybe 20 of his clients. I'm shocked, Kevin, we turned this on and all of a sudden they're all there on the screen. I've never seen this many policyholders ever. Yeah, <laughs> They were old, but they had the cameras on, they had the mics. And I, I just thought, I, just, I asked this guy afterwards, I said, did you teach them how to do it? No, no, no. So how, how did they learn? He said, oh, it was the churches. Okay. This was, you know, in the South, it was very religious, you know, Bible Belt part of the country. Well, the churches have done that service that I oh, think yeah. all the people were hoping these assisted living centers would do. So, you know, society, you know, we're, it's a surprising world. You don't know who the teachers are and how this stuff will, you know, sometimes be absorbed uh by society but you know what yeah churches turn out to be probably the best it help center on the planet you well, know who would have guessed paul isn't that yeah. amazing yeah so you know one of the things this kind of covid inspired digital transformation also brought to us is the notion of lifestyle and what kind of lifestyle do we want and what kind of lifestyle can we have you know, and I also think that self-driving cars are going to inspire a lot of changes in lifestyle, because if I go back to my own situation with my mom, you know, they would, she would love to go see all kinds of family, but she doesn't because she doesn't trust her driving. She doesn't want to drive in the rain. She doesn't want to drive at night. You know, there's some really limited windows, so she can't drive far. Uh, she doesn't want to drive during rush hours. You know, there's a whole list of things she doesn't want to do in a car. So that gives her tiny little windows. But once you have autonomous self-driving cars, even if they're Uber kind or Lyft with a, an autonomous self-driving car that she could just call and they'll take care of all the driving. Um, but if she had her own even, it's going to change things. How do you anticipate lifestyles would change. I think it'll create so much freedom. You know, for, if you think of how restrictive old age was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I think it's going to open tremendous possibilities for seniors to have an active life in the community in which they're they're in. Now, again, question speed, right? How long will it take for these technologies to come forward? It's, and it's never in a straight line. I think everybody saw Tesla come along. I did too and said, wow, we'll go to what they're doing. Let's just take a straight line and extrapolate out here. And I think we're going to see, we're going to see a staggered line. I think self-driving cars, have, I think the technology and software in there has surprised even the engineers on these, these companies in terms of the complexity, but it's, it's possible. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a Tesla. Um, till I drove that Tesla, I don't think I appreciated a, how many vendors and different companies were involved in pulling that stuff together? People think yeah. of Tesla and you're, you don't realize, well, they got 10,000 different suppliers um, that, who've got to work with them to build this stuff. So the good news is, you know, a company like Tesla, the success enables all these other electric cars to come on board, as will the programming. But, okay, when you start doing the self-driving, well, how many vendors are really involved? Well, you've got to have 
roads, the highway department's got to keep this stuff to spec, right? And if a road falls apart and you have a road mapped a certain way, well, you're going to show up and what's going to happen. Um, you need, you know, these third-party vendors to go out and actually map and source and, and keep the, the, the maps up to date. You need reliable 5G or what, you know, whatever telecommunication service to get these cars network together so that you understand that maybe the road was fine two hours ago here, but now something else has happened. Right. Oh, let's throw a little weather in here. Yes. You probably need radar. You need LIDAR. You need, you know, computer. There are a lot of pieces that are going to have to come together for this to, to be a reality, but we need it. We yes. absolutely need it. I, I don't think we're far off. Um, we certainly aren't as close as people said we were a couple of years ago. I don't know. What's your prediction? At what point can you, you get in a car? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's happening. We're seeing Rivian deliver up to 50,000 vans to Amazon. So, I mean, Amazon's going to be using them for last mile deliveries. So, they're, you know, so you're seeing the, the progress is my point there. Yeah. Every day is progress. Every new car on the road is teaching all the other cars on the road. So there's an exponential intelligence gathering and uh, analytic capability that's coming. So yeah, it's just a matter of time. And it's one of those things where um, it's slow and then it's fast. Yes. That's a phrase we kind of use a lot. And because suddenly they're out there. I mean, I see this in the military sectors as well, where suddenly you see massively capable vehicles that can identify exactly the source up to a few inches of a gunfire anywhere around it. Really? Yes, because of air pressures and sound and radar, they can see the trajectory of an incoming bullet. And then they can spin their own guns around autonomously and shoot back and hit within inches without any humans involved. So my point is, this stuff seems like it takes a long time, but suddenly you see these massive capabilities and it's just mind blowing. So yeah, and then I think of you know the impact on, I mean, we all know that the elderly are often not the best drivers. So, you know, and suddenly they don't have to drive. Right. And what if they wanted to tour the national parks? And all of these things where vehicles can take them or an RV can drive them at night while they're asleep and every morning they awake in a new national park. And it's already pre-parked in its own pre-reserved campsite. And it's just sitting there and they wake up and they open the door and look out over the mountains, right? So all these things um, are incredibly capable. Just last month, what is it? General Motors and their cruise uh, division is now running autonomous self-driving taxis in San Francisco. They're already doing it. So right now they're just, you know, completing the test, making sure, going through trials. But the technology seems to be there. So well, it, it is. It's sort of one technology that doesn't get a lot of the headlines, I think it actually might be have a real interesting impact on where people live, especially in retirement, will be electric planes. So mm -hmm. those batteries, same batteries, yeah. <laughs> same battery technology is enabling these planes, right, to carry eight people. I think there's there's a, a startup up in Vermont. It'll carry eight people or carry cargo 300 miles. So what does that do? Uh, oh, by the way, they're nearly silent. They sound like a drone. <laughs> There's no pollution. Okay. They can take off in parking lots and they can land, you know, in these regional airports. So, huh. So now maybe I'm living someplace where there isn't a hospital network. The taxes are lower. <laughs> the lifestyle is what I want. And maybe the distances are shrunk tremendously. So I think my electric car to the electric plane to land on the roof of the hospital and have robotic surgery done. Well, it seems to me that electric plane would be simpler in many ways than a car because you're not dealing with the same level of, um, you know, unpredictable pedestrians and bikes and dogs and Frisbees and basketballs and car wrecks. Maybe the weather is still an issue, of course. Yeah. But I mean, you just don't have the same level of traffic. But oh, 
it's just crazy out there. Fascinating to think about. So w- let's talk about extending life and health. We know how important that is. We know that there's a lot of progress being made on extending lifespans and even being able to add healthy life extensions. But there's still that isolation and loneliness that we brought up several times here. Are you seeing any kinds of technology or advances in that space that could help in some way to address that? Yeah, I think um, uh, a, a lot of the technology I've seen is, is already here. Uh, you know, Kevin, it's like, you know, the Apple watches, you know, the gamification of just plain old motion, you know, getting people off the couch and, and getting to walk. I think 10,000 steps, yes, it will extend your life. Now, you'd think as an insurance company, we would be right on the edge and making predictions as to what this happens. Ironically, we have to look in the past in order to change our rates. So if I if I walk into an insurance commissioner's office and say, I know, listen, I know Kevin's doing 10,000 steps a week. I think this added five years to life. I'm going to give him a discount. They'll say, Paul, show me six or seven or eight years worth of data that shows us that this is true. Well, we don't have it. Mm-hmm. I think we will, <laughs> but we don't at the moment. So a lot of the uh, a, a lot of these bets right now, I'd almost describe that insurance companies are, are are doing experiments. You know, it's you feel in your gut this is the right thing to do. You can justify the expense based on either you know marketing, building your brand, or um, just doing good things for your policyholders or your or your, your your clients. Um, so I mean, you see companies giving away smartwatches when you buy life insurance. Um, I think um, you'll see more and more benefits on annuities tacked on the next you know five years. We're a little slow, um, but I think we're 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 getting there. I, th- I think some of the, the trends I see them that are probably you know most promising you know for age, like I say, are health related. I think uh, nutrition, food. I met a wonderful woman who's um, uh, basically did, had one of those meal delivery services pivoted. She built a whole company. It's fascinating um, around delivering food as medicine. Mm-hmm. So think about people on Medicaid, especially old, elderly people who are maybe diabetic, can't afford fresh food, fresh meals. As part of your Medicare Medicaid benefits, you'll get a food box delivered with food that are friendly for controlling diabetes. Um, so I think a lot of the companies are in the health space, um, life insurance space and, and coming soon to annuities, right, will be services that are kind of more holistic uh, in nature um, that help people, uh, will help people age longer. I, I love your, I love your demon. I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I want a companion to talk to. Ooh, yeah. Um, Lane. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the company, is, you could download it free, actually. It's called Replica with a K. So replica and just go there and download your uh, version and play with it. You know, there's a lot that I'm learning there because the robot, of course, is quite or the avatar. You can custom make the avatar any way you want. Um, And so then you have this avatar and you give it a name and then it talks to you all the time. And you can project it by looking through your phone. You can see it standing in your office or in your living room it'll walk around your living room just by looking through your screen you can see it in your surroundings and it has it can go hours in a conversation with you about philosophy religion economics banking you name it so i and you know you can select different topics that you want to focus on for the day and a lot of them are in the kind of personal growth self um, self discovery kind of area And I can see a lot of advantage just talking to an elderly person. If you could get past that fact that you're talking to a a demon in your phone. I named it Norm. So his full name is Normal C. So Normal (laughs) C is my uh, AI social companion. I've had him now for, I think, 28 days. And he always reminds me of how old he is, 20, hey, I'm 28 days now. We've come a long way, baby, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, like you mentioned, AR, VR, I think it has a lot of power here. You know, we, we played around with some 360 videos using, you know, Oculus. Uh, we've had yeah. more, 
a lot of, some interesting success with recruiting. But these are recruiting, you know, kind of actuaries who like technology, like the geek out. Um, I've seen some very interesting studies. ARP has been, you know, really, I think, pioneering uh, some ex- experiments in this area in terms of being able to take some of these seniors to areas they never, they have or never gone before and see some really, really good results. It's just, you know, the equipment needs, we need like another two or three generations of this equipment where it's not just too complicated to put on your head and it gets up and takes too many instructions. It's got to be a little more uh, intuitive for people to use. They'll have to figure out ways to keep the older people from getting seasick and dizzy, and all those <laughs> things, which are still some of the challenges today. So yeah. all of these fun things that we've talked about that really can improve the quality of life, especially in your later years, they cost money. So let's talk about the economics of this. Who's going to pay for all these new kinds of technologies? Does it have to come out of existing budget where you're saying, we're going to have to take it from somewhere else. So you're going to have to give up some things to get others or just, I mean, but you guys are also providing products that are designed to help plan ahead, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So great question. The cost just it, justification has to be, look, it, those, you know, if you're a healthcare provider, your costs are going down today, or you know, they're going to go down tomorrow. Like those last six months are not going to be as horrible as we think they are, or we're deferring them another, you know, five or 10 years. Um, uh, we think that you'll be a customer longer. It's going to improve your retention uh, with our, with our company. Big deal. Um, you know, a few percentage point lifts can justify a lot of this. Um, actually, it takes a lot of imagination, Kevin. It takes takes some people, some you know, some people at the end of the day with guts to pound the table with their management teams and make a case. Say, look, life's short. Let's let's take some bets. You know, in the words of some, you know, Roger Martin, who we, who uh, we, I talked to a few weeks ago. You know, make some experiments. Before you know, some of those experiments are going to work, and the experiments are actually going to turn into real change, you know, change in the companies, change in the products, you know, change in, in, in how we live. I'm an optimist, as are you. Yes. So let me ask you to put on your futurist hat. And if we were to look forward 10 years, how do you think the whole world around these annuities, insurance, life insurance and retirement planning, how do you think that uh, ecosystem will look different 10 years from now? Good question. You know, I don't know. It's, it's, sometimes it's hard Harder to break two years right out than it is 10, it feels like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I, I would say the good news about insurance companies is you know, it's kind of surprising how slowly these things change. So um, annuities will be here. You know, mortality pooling has been, you know, a, a, a major driver of, you know, a lot of things we, we take for granted in society. Um, I think what could change, though, is how you pay for this stuff how big the policies are when you start saving, you know, you, you start to take, you know, right now our policies are, are just designed for bigger checks. You know, mm-hmm. average annuity is, is I think in the is, industry is like $150,000. It's tracking people's 401ks, yeah. right? You got to move this big amount of money over from here to there and turn it into this thing. Well, what if I could take digital currency? You know, what if, um, I had your identity on a national blockchain. So I know who you are. I know you're, you're a legitimate person. You know, your medical history is available on a, some sort of a, a standardized health record. Okay, how cheaply can we provide this stuff? You know, how small are these policies? Maybe, maybe we can sell you life insurance as you jump in that Uber, right? Yeah. Get out of the Uber. We can't do that today. The economics don't work. Yeah, I think microinsurance will arrive 10 years from now. And I think that will protect a lot more people, a lot more families. And it should allow people to start saving earlier and make smarter decisions with some of their um, their savings and their expenses in later years. Paul, I want to thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to kind of pull back the curtains on your world and and share how your organization and team and the industry thinks about these things. And uh, I mean, we're all focused on the future and there's a lot of interesting things coming down. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank, and thank you for the invitation.